Will the graduates and faculty please rise for the passing of the stage party? Will everyone please rise for the presentation of the colors and the singing of the national anthem by Jack Chandler. Oh, say, can you see by the dawn's early light what so proudly we hailed at the twilight's last gleaming, whose broad stripes and bright stars through the perilous fight o'er the ramparts we watched were so gallantly streaming. And the rocket's red glare, the bombs bursting in air, gave proof through the night that our flag was still there. Oh, say does that star-spangled banner yet wave o'er the land of the free and the home of the brave.
Please be seated. Well, good afternoon. On behalf of the university community, it is my pleasure to welcome you to the fall 2016 graduate commencement exercises. Let me begin by introducing the individuals sitting on the stage who are here to honor today's graduates and represent the academic and administrative leadership of the university. We are pleased to have with us representatives from Virginia Tech's Board of Visitors. Board members are appointed by the governor and Virginia Tech greatly benefits from the deep and genuine commitment to the university. I am honored to introduce our rector, Mr. James Chapman, and I'd also like to welcome Dr. Montessera Bass, faculty representative to the Board of Visitors, and Ms. Tara Reel, our graduate student representatives, representative. Ladies and gentlemen, please recognize with your applause their represent, these representatives of the university's governing board. At this time, I am pleased to introduce the senior leadership and deans of our colleges. Dr. Alan Grant, Dean, College of Agriculture and Life Sciences. Professor Jack Davis, Dean, College of Architecture and Urban Studies. Dr. Robert Sumacrast, Dean, Pamplin College of Business. Dr. G. Don Taylor, Jr., Interim Dean, College of Engineering. Dr. Deborah L. Stout, Associate Dean, College of Liberal Arts and Human Sciences. Dr. Paul Winnestorfer, Dean, College of Natural Resources and Environment. Dr. Sally Morton, Dean, College of Science. Dr. Paul Knox, Dean, Honors College. Dr. Thanasis Rakakis, Executive Vice President and Provost. Dr. Karen DePaw, Vice President and Dean for Graduate Education. Mr. Sherwood Wilson, Vice President for Administration. Mr. Matthew Winston, Jr., Senior Associate Vice President for Alumni Relations. Dr. Scott Midkiff, Vice President for Information Technology and Chief Information Officer. Dr. Patricia Perillo, Vice President for Student Affairs. Dr. Teresa Mayer, Vice President for Research and Innovation. Dr. Rosemary Bliesner, Associate Dean of the Graduate School. Dr. Amy Pruden, Associate Dean of the Graduate School. Also on stage are Dr. Rami Dalul, the Commencement Marshal, Ms. Marwa K. Abdul-Latif, the Graduate Student Marshal, Ms. Erin Lavender-Stott, the Graduate Honor System Chief Justice, Ms. Chelsea Corkins, President of the Graduate Student Assembly, and Dr. Joseph Marola, who will read the names of our graduates. The speakers will be introduced shortly. Thank you. Through this ceremony, we recognize your significant achievement and celebrate your talents, your skills, and your hard work. It's also important to note that these students would not have achieved their goals without the teaching, guidance, and mentorship of Virginia Tech's outstanding faculty. I would now like to ask the faculty to please stand and be recognized. Just as crucial as the role of the faculty, the supporting cast of family, friends, and community members behind each graduate deserve recognition. Would these individuals please stand so that we can congratulate you as well? That's pretty much everybody else. <laughs> Graduate students are important to the university's research, teaching, and engagement missions, and are able to earn degrees in Blacksburg, at locations across the Commonwealth, and online. During the summer and fall semesters, 1,182 students earned advanced degrees and certificates from an offering of 89 master's and 70 doctoral programs in eight colleges. There are approximately 310 graduates here today. As part of the graduate commencement, we invite an outstanding graduate student to provide a brief message on behalf of the graduating student body.
followed by the keynote speaker to provide reflections and perspectives. It's now my pleasure to present Virginia Tech's Executive Vice President and Provost, Thanasis Rakakis, who will introduce the graduate student speaker and keynote speaker. Thank you, President Sands. It is my pleasure to introduce our graduate student speaker, Greg Purdy, who will receive his doctorate today in industrial and systems engineering. Mr. Purdy is the past president of the Graduate Student Assembly and currently serves as a research assistant professor in the Graduate Department of Industrial and Systems Engineering. Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome Greg Purdy. Good afternoon, graduates. How are you doing today? That's right. Come on, come on. I want to hear you. How are you doing today? That's right. I am thankful for this opportunity to congratulate each and every one of you. Earning an advanced degree is really, really hard. Take that from someone who's been here for over six years and is finally finishing. But in all seriousness, you deserve all the praise you're receiving today. So please enjoy it. Believe it or not, I didn't learn much about speech writing and engineering. So as I prepared for today, I struggled to settle on a message that would resonate with all of you. Last week, I was on the phone with my best friend. He's actually here in the audience today, somewhere. I lost him. But uh, while we were chatting, we were talking about his trip to Blacksburg. I was walking around campus and passed by the amphitheater outside of the Graduate Life Center. As some of you may know, there's engraved hokey stones which raise the amphitheater stage. I started looking at the messages on the stones and saw one that read the following. GSA, inspiring change, improving lives. For most people, the significance of this stone may not be apparent, but that's not the case for me. I've spent my time at Virginia Tech involved with the Graduate Student Assembly, or GSA for short. It's funny now, because when I started graduate school, one of my goals was to not get too involved in extracurricular activities. Serving as the president of GSA, traveling abroad to learn about global higher education, and helping to craft my department's strategic plan were certainly not on my radar. But I learned that sometimes you don't always progress towards your degree at the pace you want. Sometimes your research ends up being completely different from what you came here to do. And sometimes your free time isn't really free at all. I've come to realize that some of my best work wasn't necessarily done in the lab or in front of a computer. It was working with the Hokie community to improve the lives of graduate students. It was collaborating with other students, faculty, staff, and administrators to tackle a variety of complex issues, such as providing affordable childcare for our students, making quality dental insurance available, and of course, everybody's favorite issue. Any guesses? That's right, parking. Through these experiences, I figured out that I love working on these problems. I find joy in helping others find their passion and showing them that they too can make a difference. All you truly need to do is care and to try. This brings me back to the engraved stone at the amphitheater. It said, inspiring change, improving lives. How will you inspire change? For me, inspiring change is empowering a student to find their own passions through their education. How will you improve lives? It can be as simple as being kind and complimenting a friend or colleague. It can mean reaching out to a complete stranger and showing them compassion. It's easy to get caught up and forget that it's not just the lifelong works that change the world. The actions we take each and every day do too. Change comes in many forms, but it starts with you. It starts with caring, love, respect, and compassion for others. Today is for celebrating your accomplishments, but the work is just beginning. How will you affect change? How will you channel your passion? How will you change the world? Unfortunately, I don't have the answer. But as I stand here today, I'm really happy to be standing here today, and look towards the future, I'm filled with hope. So I close with my question, or rather the challenge, how will you change the world? Thank you.
Well, thank you, Craig. And I do want to vouch that Craig's uh, resilience is, is very clear. Not only is he getting his doctorate, but also he has been able, working with the graduate college, to get dental insurance for all graduate students. Yeah, uh, and to expand uh, daycare. Of course, he hasn't solved the parking problem, but that's never solved. I still get tickets, and I'm 53 years old. So, <laughs> so I keep working on that one, Craig, will you? All right. Uh, now I have the pleasure to introduce longtime activist and community engagement leader, Andrew Morikawa. Mr. Morikawa currently serves as a senior fellow with the School of Public and International Affairs Institute for Policy and Governance, where he works with the graduate student-led Community Voices Speaker Series and produces the Trustees Without Borders podcast. He's, he also is a fellow with the Virginia Tech Honors Residential College and is an affiliated faculty member of the Institute for Creativity, Arts, and Technology. In addition to his work with Virginia Tech, he is actively involved in the Dialogue on Race, a community organization in Montgomery County, and is chairman of the board of the Community Housing Partners Corporation. Before retiring in 2010, he was the executive director of the Community Foundation of the New River Valley, which he led for 13 years and served for eight years as CEO of WellShare, an international development and food distribution nonprofit. He earned a Bachelor's of Arts degree from Kalamazoo College. Please help me welcome Mr. Andrew Morikawa. Thank you, Provost Rikakis, for your kind introduction. President Sands, Vice President Thien, for graduate education. Depa, thank you for inviting me to speak at this commencement. I'm deeply honored to be here with you. Graduates, family members, faculty, and friends, it's a privilege to be with you today to share some brief reflections as a contribution to your day of celebration. I've structured my remarks around a story from the past, a story from the future, and a suggestion concerning how we can make our way forward at a time of great moment in the life of the American democracy. If at first my comments feel more serious than celebratory, I do promise to end on an optimistic note. To provide you some context, let me share my career with you briefly, which began as a Peace Corps volunteer in the 1960s and has spanned some 40 years of service as a nonprofit organization executive, board member, and a consultant. When I retired in 2010, Professor Max Stevenson, the director of the Virginia Tech Institute for Policy and Governance, invited me to join the Institute as a fellow to help produce the Community Voices program. Community Voices, as some of you know, is an interdisciplinary, graduate student-managed discussion and speaker series that connects community leaders, innovators, and social entrepreneurs with citizens, with Virginia Tech students and faculty members. It gives students a hands-on perspective and a real-time window into the social, political, and economic challenges and movements of our time. The group addresses challenges such as those we are encountering now in the aftermath of our nation's recent presidential election. President Sands, in his November 9 letter to the Virginia Tech community, observed this about the times that we now confront. This presidential election season has tested our fortitude, our character as a country, our values, and our commitment to civility. With Dr. Sands' remarks in mind, I have found myself wondering how, as individuals and as national community, we will navigate the coming years. I've drawn on my own history to help me gain a measure of perspective. And so here's the first story I promised. It concerns my mother and father. Married in September of 1941, they were newlyweds as they began their first assignment together. He was a Baptist pastor, fresh out of Southern Baptist Seminary, and she was a Sunday school teacher who had been doing mission work with Japanese fishermen and their families on Terminal Island in Los Angeles County in California. These American sweethearts began their life together serving a circuit of small English-speaking churches serving individuals of Japanese ancestry in Los Angeles. 
In December of that year, with the Japanese attack on Pearl Harbor, their lives as American citizens ended. Under Executive Order 9066, issued on February the 9th, 1942, the American government detained, or to put it more bluntly, imprisoned, more than 110,000 people of Japanese ancestry who lived on the Pacific coast. 62% of those who were so treated were United States citizens, born, raised, and educated in the United States. My parents, my mom's parents, and everyone in their family were taken from their homes in Gardena, California to an assembly center, which in their case was the Santa Anita racetrack, where they slept on straw in horse stalls while they awaited transport to their assigned detention camp. My mom later wrote about the experience. We were required as our next step before being exiled to go to one of the civil control stations where we were given a family number. We were tagged family number 34412. This was to be our identification at all times. Our eviction order came in May of 1942. We were to be taken by train with blacked out windows to a place called Poston, the Colorado River Relocation Center, which was an old Indian reservation in the heart of a barren desert in Arizona, about 150 miles northwest of Phoenix, where the heat soared to 120 degrees in the shade. We were allowed to take only what could be carried by hand, everything to be properly affixed, of course, with the family number. They lived nearly two years in tar paper shacks in sweltering desert, in the sweltering desert heat in the summer, and freezing cold during the winter months before being released. Once free, they moved to Chicago, where my dad became a pastor of the First Baptist Church there. As I grew older, the import of their stories of the evacuation and camp life became clearer. I remember talking to my dad and asking if he was angry about the experience of being thrown into a detention camp. No, I'm not angry, he said. When I asked him why, he explained, after we got out of the camp, I told myself that from then on, I would do whatever I could so that something like that would never happen again in America. We must overcome our racism, which turns us against each other. In a time of national crisis and threat, in the America I know is possible, we would see each other as fellow human beings and learn to turn to each other, to turn to each other for help and not out of fear, turn against those who look different from us. He wasn't angry. He said, I know that America at its best will not do that again, but only if we all work to make it so. In a sermon he gave at the Riverside Church in New York City on patriotism and human rights, he concluded, America in its highest moments has assumed the oneness of the human family under God. He held out for that vision of America he believed in and worked throughout his life to help attain it. For me, our nation's tragic internment episode highlights the danger and the consequence of getting out of touch with one another and then, because we do not know our fellow citizens, falling prey to not trusting them and ending up too readily turning against one, e one another. My mother and father endured confinement and ostracism because the nation allowed itself to act on voices of fear and of hatred. The internment camps provide a historical lesson of what can happen when Americans refuse to honor and to act on their own ideals. However, as my father spent the remainder of his life arguing, if enough of us are engaged in relationship and work together across differences of race and class and of culture, America can turn away from fear, from scapegoating and othering. It will not take everyone, not even a majority of us for that to happen, but it will take a critical mass, just enough people to set off a quickening wisdom and confidence that overcome our collective anxieties. 
In that spirit, my second story is about an African-American fork truck operator who works in a local manufacturing plant here in the New River Valley, who felt that the only way to end racial injustice in our community was to sit everyone down and to work it out. Accordingly, she organized a small group of individuals willing to tackle the issues with her, and together they identified critical areas of concern and what they believed needed to happen to address them. They invited others in the community to meet with them in January of 2013 to continue and deepen their dialogue for action. As that individual, Penny Franklin, has recalled, we figured if 25 or 30 people turned out at this first community gathering, we would be well on our way. That Saturday morning, bitter cold, with snow starting to fall, the organizers watched as the parking lot began to fill. More than 100 people turned out for that first community summit, including two area chiefs of police and the county sheriff. No fingers were pointed that day, no blame assigned. Instead, the African-American community presented concerns and asked the assembled, diverse audience for help. Five years later, the project, which is called the Dialogue on Race, continues to gain momentum. Indeed, in the weeks since the election, more than twice the usual number of people have signed up for the annual Community Summit on Racial Injustice that's being held here next month. Similarly, national, state, and local nonprofits have lately been reporting increased donations, increased offers of volunteer help, and increased website visits. Something's happening here. Folks seem to be waking up and remembering what their communities need, their involvement and participation. We can and must help ourselves, and in so doing, come to understand our common humanity. You know, as I reflect on these two stories and on our post-election world, I see our present circumstance as having arisen as the result of our growing inattention to civic life and our consequent lack of civic fitness. I think we've become less and less engaged in community life via our involvement in the work of nonprofits, in church community work, neighborhood associations. We stay in touch by being engaged in the life of our communities. For the long term, for the long term stability and the strength of our community and ultimately of our country, we need to interact with one another regularly in organized ways with purposes that are beyond our personal desires and that find us engaged in the pursuit of the common good, which can, when you think about it, finds us individually and collectively serving not only the now, but the future for ourselves, for our children, and our children's children. In an important sense, this very simple basic stuff, this is very simple basic stuff. Indeed, to me, it's like a fitness program for community. For personal fitness, whatever we do, it is discipline and practice that keeps us in shape. The same is true of engaging in the life of our communities. Those efforts, too, constitute a discipline that if we, under, if we stop undertaking it, allows our civic life to become flabby or even to break down, like the post-election mess that we are in right now. So the question is how to react to the polarization the fear, the animus now so evident in our country. The step that I've taken and can recommend to others is get involved if they are not, to get more engaged if they are, or as the Nike advertising campaign would have it, just do it. If we do not individually undertake such efforts, I fear that we may drift toward a time when we might too readily again contemplate confining or diminishing the rights of people who are different on the basis that their difference frightens us. Again, the only thing I can see to do now to prevent this possibility or one similar to it is to get more 
and more Americans engaged in civic life, in community improvement and wellness, disciplined, informed, connected, bringing together university and community, church and civic groups, black and white, old and young, conservatives and progressives. As we get and stay engaged, we meet people different from us. We find out often that our assumptions about others, our fears, were not accurate. In fact, engagement nearly always reveals that we Americans have more in common than not. My father believed in America. I believe in America. In this time of great uncertainty, I am turning my focused attention to the community of place where I live, believing that this is where I can make a difference and that the difference my community needs is for me, indeed, for all of us in our respective communities to be more engaged, not in a fancy highfalutin way, but in a showing up way, being attentive, being willing to listen, to empathize, attending community meetings regularly, being willing to chair a civic group, donating or tithing to local charities. I am optimistic and hopeful that we can avoid fresh, terrible civic injustice because I see vivid living experiments of people acting in just such ways going on right now, right here in our local community, like the dialogue on race. What's needed now is sitting at the same table, face to face, week in, week out, month in, month out, having tough conversations with those who do not necessarily share our views, and getting good at it. That's it. Getting involved, practicing our citizenship, getting good at being a democracy, a charitable community of trust and of freedom. In closing, I have learned this from the example of the Community Voices graduate student team, that you, today's graduates, will provide the democratic leadership our country now needs. The opportunity awaits you to act, and vitally to do so on the basis of all that you have learned here at Virginia Tech. Consequently, all of us in community with you will also grow in capacity and willingness to serve our common well-being, and together create an America we can all cherish. So congratulations on the accomplishments you celebrate today, and be sure to share their fruits with others in the communities in which you will live and work. Indeed, our collective future depends on it. Thank you. God bless you. God bless Virginia Tech. God bless America. Thank you very much, Andy. We appreciate your words. I also appreciate your commitment to graduate education and reminding us of the need for inclusive, engaged dialogues, and I hope that we will all participate in these dialogues. Each year, we select an unexpecting graduate student for a special recognition. Drum roll. And I would like to ask Marwa Abdel Latif to stand up, and she does not know. Marwa is receiving her PhD in chemistry today. She calls herself a woman without a country because she was born and raised in Beirut, Lebanon, as a third generation Palestinian refugee who, until recently, had no citizenship in any country. Yes, you can applaud. So. Marwa attended a refugee school through high school and received a scholarship to attend Randolph-Macon Women's College. She says that without that support, quote, I never would have had the chance to become who I am today, end quote. She has served in many student leadership capacities at Virginia Tech, has received awards for her teaching, service, scholarship, and mentorship. Her volunteer efforts include working on developing new programs in United Nations Relief and Works Agency, 
in hopes of helping refugees better understand science. She is currently working with distance learning and exchange programs at the Macromolecular Institute. Mara said recently, and quoting again, I am fortunate enough to be given this opportunity, which has shaped my life as a true global citizen and provided me with the hope to overcome the circumstances into which I was born. Rarely do we choose the environment where we are born, but we can definitely choose who we can become, and sometimes with a little bit of help, it can go a very long way. Congratulations, Marwa. Thank you for your efforts throughout your time as a graduate student, and congratulations on becoming a U.S. citizen. Now that's just one story, and there are many, many other stories, and each of you has a story, um, but we can't spend all the time talking about your stories or the journeys or we will never get out of here today. But I will attempt to highlight some milestones and achievements that you have experienced along the way. The individual journey varies, especially given the multiple locations through which we offer our graduate degrees in, here in Blacksburg, National Capital Region, Roanoke, Richmond, and well beyond, virtual, etc. To begin, and this is the interactive part. Some of you have seen me do this before. This is where I'm going to ask you to rise and keep stand and remain standing. So to begin, I want to recognize the graduate students from the National Capital Region who have earned their degrees virtually or who have attended part-time. Please stand. Please stand. I know you are here. Uh, many of yes. And I want the audience to see, because we often think that our graduate students are here in Blacksburg, and yes, they are, but indeed, they are other places. So please remain standing, and thank you very much for being here. Please stand if you have received a national fellowship or scholarship, or one bestowed by local or region governments, corporations, or professional societies. I know you're out there too. Are you, did you stand, okay. That's just, okay, I have to do some prompting here, which is fine. Um, please stand if you are a recipient of the outstanding master's student or doctoral student in each college, or the Alumni Association Graduate Teaching Excellence or Service Awards, or the William Preston Society Master Thesis, or were the Graduate Student of the Year. Please stand if you've earned recognition as a grad school citizen scholar or diversity scholar, participated in the Graduate School Global Perspectives Program, just doing some eye contact prompting as well. Um, please stand if you are inducted into the Interdisciplinary Research Honor Society, Iota Delta Roy, Ro, pardon me, or have served in the university by participating in the graduate honor system or in the governance through the graduate student assembly on a university committee. There should be more of you who are, are standing by now. Representative to the, to the Board of Visitors, participated in graduate student assembly, research symposium, GUMP program, travel research award, uh, award through, uh, or many of the events and workshops sponsored by the graduate school. Please stand and remain standing if you have held an assistantship, either a teaching assistant, research assistant, or general GA assistantship. Okay, I, I, each year there's a different trigger. Okay, now this one, please stand if you have ever visited the Graduate Life Center or any lecture, symposium, or class held in the Graduate Life Center, rented one of the rooms, lived in the GLC, visited the GLC cafe, visited the grad school offices. Now, I think most of you have had to at least virtually come visit us, um, either in the GLC, Falls Church, Alexandria facilities, participated with Lisa, the Counseling Center, the Career Services, uh, relaxed by the fountain on the outdoor GLC plaza. Maybe some of you have rented the GLC bikes. <laughs> and I have failed if I haven't gotten everybody to stand. So I hope that all of our graduate students are standing because the audience, please join me in congratulating and thanking our graduates.
Okay, you may be seated. Thank you. One of the great pleasures of being the graduate school dean is to introduce the candidates for graduate degrees. We're almost ready to do that, but I also want to share with you first a tradition that the grad school began 10 years ago, and that was to present an original music composition as a gift to the graduating students. Today's composition is written by Professor James Sosinski, and its title is Ad Futurum Formandum, which is a paraphrasing of the university slogan, Invent the Future. What, we, what follows next is a playing of the music as well as um, the images and reflections that you will see up on the stand. Thank you. 
We will now begin the conferral of doctoral degrees. A very old and special tradition in academia accompanies the presentation of the doctoral degree. The doctoral candidate and the student's major advisor, the advisor who most mentored and supervised the student's research, walk together to the stage where the advisor places the hood over the head of the graduate. By hooding the graduate, the faculty member symbolically welcomes the graduate as a professional colleague, and this professional relationship and friendship often continues through the graduates and the mentors' lives. Will all the candidates for the Doctor of Philosophy and the Doctor of Education degrees please rise? President Sands, I have the honor to present the candidates for the Doctor of Philosophy and the Doctor of Education degrees. With the power vested in me by the Board of Visitors and the Commonwealth of Virginia, and upon recommendation of the faculty, I confer upon you the Doctor of Philosophy and Doctor of Education degrees to which you are entitled with all the rights, privileges, and responsibilities pertaining thereto. You may be seated. Will the marshals please escort the candidates for the doctoral degrees and their major professors to the stage for the hooding ceremony? Joseph Marola will now be reading the names of the doctoral recipients and the hooding professors. Receiving the Doctor of Philosophy from the College of Agriculture and Life Sciences in Animal and Dairy Sciences, Adam John Geiger, hooded by Professor Mike Acres. In Agricultural and Extension Education, David Adam Kletzer, hooded by Professor Eric Kaufman. Michael Antonio Silas hooded by Professors Eric Kaufman and Hannah Scherer. <laughs> Tanisha Marie Woods-Wells, hooded by Professors Curtis Friedel and Professor Megan Seibel. In biochemistry, Rehana Ojani, hooded by Professor Jin Song Ju. In crop and soil environmental sciences, Christopher Warren Fields Johnson, hooded by Professor John Fike. Bishal Gola Tamang, hooded by Professor Takishi Fukawa. Eric D. Severson, 
hooded by Professor Lee Daniels. In economics, agriculture, and life sciences, Wei Bin Shu, hooded by Professor Lee Daniels. In entomology, Sudan Gyawali, hooded by Professor Thomas Kuhar. In food science and technology, Nairan Baik, hooded by Professor Sean O'Keefe. In horticulture, Rachel Nicole Seman Varner, hooded by Professor Thomas Kuhar. In human nutrition, foods, and exercises, Amal Sami Al Mohana, hooded by Professors Elena Serrano and Professor Bill Barbeau. Long Hua Yu, hooded by Professor Elena Serrano. Fabiana Brito Silva, hooded by Professor Fabio Almeida. In plant pathology, physiology, and weed sciences, something we very rarely have, a set of twins. Kevin E. Fedkenher, hooded by Professor John McDowell, and Michael Fedkenher, hooded by Professor John McDowell. David Scott McCall, hooded by Professor Anton Baudouin and Professor Sean Askew. Sandeep Singh Rana, hooded by Professor Sean Askew. From the College of Architecture and Urban Studies in Architecture and Design Research, Anna R. Dutro, hooded by Professor Jack Davis. In Environmental Design and Planning, Ola Watiniola, uh, Eniola Ladipo hooded by Professor Georg Reichard. <laughs> Eric Michael Wetzel, hooded by Professor Taniel Bulbo. In Planning, Governance, and Globalization, William Brian Riddle, hooded by Prof Professor Christian Mathais. From the College of Engineering, in Aerospace Engineering, 
David William Allen, hooded by Professor Craig Woolsey. Daniel Cadell, hooded by Professor Todd Lowe. Rick Malek, hooded by Professor Joseph Schetz. Yui Wu, hooded by Professor Todd Lowe. In biomedical engineering, Rong Chen, hooded by Professor Clay Gabler. William Brad Hubbard, hooded by Professor Pamela Vandevoord. Bethany Marie Rousen, hooded by Professor Stefan Duma. Pooja Sharma, hooded by Professor Amrinder Nain. In civil engineering, Marcus Aguilar, hooded by Professor Randall Diamond. <laughs> Ashley Margot Cabas Mijares, hooded by Professor Adrian Rodriguez Matic. Celso Francisco Castro Bolinaga, hooded by Professor Adrian Rodriguez Marek. Rafik Gerges Al Helu, hooded by Professor Christopher Moen. Xiao Ching hooded by Professor Sunil Sinha. Clayton Christopher Hodges, hooded by Professor Randall Diamond. Adam Richard Phillips, hooded by Professor Matthew Etherton. <laughs> Ching Yun Ping, hooded by Professor Jen He. <laughs> Maria Virginia Riquelme Breazial, hooded by Professor Peter Weixland and Professor Amy Pruden. In computer engineering, Shareen Fatih Mohammed Gaber Ali, hooded by Professor Lynn Abbott. Kelson Andrew Gent, hooded by Professor Michael Shao. In computer science and applications, Ahmed Mohammed Mohammed Ateya, hooded by Professor Adrian Sandu. Surichi Deodar, hooded by Professor Madhav Marathi. <laughs> M 
Mohammed Fauzi Sadiq Fargali, hooded by Professor Clifford Schaefer. Peter Josef Radix, hooded by Professor Nicholas Polis. In electrical engineering, Hamida Bitaraf, hooded by Professor Luke Lester. <laughs> Kelly Catherine Dobson, hooded by Professor Hong Bo Zhang. Richard Henry Tillman, hooded by Professor Stephen Ellingson. In engineering education, Corey Allen Hickson, hooded by Professor Marie Peretti. Homero Gregorio Merzi Escobar, hooded by Professor Lisa McNair. In engineering mechanics, Bilal Aidi, hooded by Professor Scott Case. Bikramjit Mukherjee, hooded by Professor David Dillard. In industrial and systems engineering, Ari Joseph Goldberg, hooded by Professor Deborah Dickerson. Fernando Gonzalez Alu Gonzalez, hooded by Professor Eileen Van Aken. Oscar A. Herrera Restrepo, hooded by Professor Eileen Van Aken. Gregory T. Purdy, hooded by Professor Jaime Camillo. In mechanical engineering, Mohamed Bonakdar, hooded by Professor Rafael Davalos. Omid Ghassimali Zadi, hooded by Professor Sahid Tahedi. <laughs> Yu Lun Yu, hooded by Professor Shashank Priya. <laughs> Chong Huag Nguyen, hooded by Professor Rafael Davalos. <laughs> David Park, hooded by Professor Francine Battaglia. <laughs> Nathan Lowell Sharps, hooded by Professor Shashank Priya. <laughs> Yan Kun Song, hooded by Professor Javid Bayandor. <laughs> In mining engineering, Elland Galiland, 
hooded by Professor Nino Rapepi. From the College of Liberal Arts and Human Sciences in Curriculum and Instruction, Mashael Hassan Al Katani, hooded by Professor Barbara Lockie. <laughs> Stephen Michael Biscott, hooded by Professor Peter Doolittle. <laughs> Donna Fortune Fogelsong hooded by Professor Mary Ellis Barksdale. <laughs> Elizabeth Jean Gilpin, hooded by Professor Mary Alice Barksdale. <laughs> Paige Hayes Horst, hooded by Professor Amy Azano. <laughs> Raymond Vidal Plaza, hooded by Professor Griselda Tilly Lubbs. Mary Elizabeth Tackett, hooded by Professor Mary Alice Barksdale and Professor Amy Azano. Jacqueline Claire Woodyard, hooded by Professor Barbara Lockie. April Michelle Workman, hooded by Professor Thomas Williams. In Educational Research and Evaluation, Maria Stack Henke, hooded by Professor Penny Burge. Ryan Brock Mutchison, hooded by Professor Gary Skaggs. In Higher Education, Francis Keene, hooded by Professor Joan Hurt. Jonathan William Manns, hooded by Professor Frank Shushak. James C. Penven, hooded by Professor Joan Hurt. In Human Development, Laura R. Bivens, hooded by Professor Tina Savla. <laughs> In Social, Political, Ethical, and Cultural Thought, Edwin Kent Morris, hooded by Professor Francois Debris. From the College of Natural Resources and Environment in Fisheries and Wildlife, Catherine M. Jahowski, hooded by Professor William Hopkins. Andrew Brony Niowski, hooded by Professor Mark Ford. From the College of Science 
in biological sciences. Jing Jing Yu, hooded by Professor Carla Finkelstein. Sally A. Zemmer, hooded by Professor Fred Benfield. <laughs> In chemistry, Marwa K. Abdel Latif, Hooded by Professor James Tanko. <laughs> Spencer Ray Ehrenholtz, hooded by Professor Amanda Morris. <laughs> Molly D. Congdon hooded by Professor Webster Santos. <laughs> Bryce Edwin Kidd, hooded by Professor Lewis Madsen. <laughs> Evan David Margareta, Hooded by Professor Timothy Long. <laughs> Amanda K. Nelson. Hooded by Professor Webster Santos. Roberto Padilla. Hooded by Professor Brenda Winkle. Ching Shi Su, hooded by Professor David Kingston. Asta Verma, hooded by Professor Paul Carlier. Jessica Elaine Wynn, hooded by Professor Webster Santos. In psychology, Kelsey E. Baines, hooded by Professor Robert Stevens. In statistics, Marcos Arantes Carsolio, hooded by Professor Scotland Lehman. <laughs> An Gong Zhang, hooded by Professor Xin Wei Dung. From the Virginia Maryland Regional College of Veterinary Medicine in Biomedical and Veterinary Sciences, Alice Elizabeth Hauk Miles, hooded by Professor David Lindsay. <laughs> Garrett Paul Smith, hooded by Professor Namalwar Sriranganathan. Ruo Shi Yuan, hooded by Professor Li Wu Li. <laughs> Receiving doctoral degrees from interdisciplinary programs in genetics, bioinformatics, and computational biology, Yu Feng Fang, hooded by Professor Brett Tyler. In macromolecular science and engineering, Halei 
Jideem Arja, quoted by Professor Kevin Edgar. Andrew Thomas Shaver, quoted by Professor Judy Riffle. From the College of Liberal Arts and Human Sciences, receiving the Doctor of Education in Curriculum and Instruction, Anita Sue Deck, put it by Professor John Wells. In Educational Leadership and Policy Studies, Freeman Darnell Carter, put it by Professor Carol Cash. Wesley W. Erie, put it by Professor Carol Cash. <laughs> Rebecca Lee Yearout, put it by Professor Glenn Earthman. Congratulations to all of our new doctoral recipients. <clears throat> Among the graduates today are individuals who have earned post-master's education specialist degrees, and many of you have also earned a graduate certificate. I want to congratulate you on those achievements. The university offers many distinctive master's degrees, including a large, num from, a large number from disciplines that can confer the Master of Arts degree or the Master of Science. In addition, we also offer, and you, many of you have received, the Master of Fine Arts, the Master of Business Administration, and professional master's degrees in disciplines such as architect architecture, business, education, engineering, forestry, information technology, landscape, architecture, natural resources, public health, and, and public affairs and urban planning. Will all the masters, candidates for master's degree please rise. <laughs> President Sands. President Sands, I have the honor to present the candidates for the master's degree. Thank you, Dean DePaul. With the power vested in me by the Board of Visitors in the Commonwealth of Virginia and upon recommendation of the faculty, I confer upon you the master's degrees to which you are entitled with all the rights, privileges, and responsibilities pertaining thereto. You may be seated, except maybe the first row. <laughs> Will, will the marshals please escort the candidates for master's degrees to the stage? At this time, Professor Marola will be reading the names of the master's degree recipients. From the College of Agriculture and Life Sciences, receiving the Masters of Science in Agriculture and Applied Economics, Montgomery McCarthy. <laughs> receiving the Masters of Science in Dairy Science, Carrie Estes. Receiving the Master of Life Sciences in Entomology, Benjamin Ainer. <laughs> Kenton Sumter. <laughs> Receiving the Masters of Life Sciences in Food, Science, and Technology, Brianna Ewing.
Joshua Lee. Kayla Moberg. Natalie Pulido. Receiving the Masters of Science in Agriculture and Life Sciences, Anya Cross. Stephen Manchester. From the College of Architecture and Urban Studies, receiving the Master of Architecture, Yen Nong. Megan Kelly. Stephen Dar. Receiving the Master of Science in Building Construction, Science and Management, Rachel Johnson. Zara Mirian Hossein Abadi. George Williams. Receiving the Master of Fine Arts in Creative Technologies, Anirudh Mitra. Zachary Bush. Fat Nguyen. Matthew Yorshaw. Gwendolyn Sewell. Receiving the Master of Public and International Affairs in Government and International Affairs, Sarah Johnson. Receiving the Master of Public Administration and Public Affairs, Brittany Edwards. Tracy McCoy. Julie Huff. Receiving the Master of Urban and Regional Planning, Spencer Shanholtz. From the Pamplin College of Business, receiving the Masters of Accounting and Information Systems, Cassandra King. Ann Quetch. Laura Rader. Zhao Ching Kuo. Shi Tong Zheng. Ching Yan Zheng. Yu Sun. Receiving the Master of Business Administration, John Vibrock. Jaima Fekak. Brandon Brodkin. Brendan Jadzorski. Maria Vindam Bernan Saihayam. Lauren Miller. Albert Knowles. Andrew Sweeney. Shannon Ferreira. Zane Alwash. Mark Pachowski. Kathleen Flanagan Rhodes. Devin Giuliano. Joshua Kwasinski. Patrick Lester.
John Duke III, Adam Peters, Vijay Kilnani, Christopher Tuck, Srikanth Ramabhadran, Wei Han Lai, Matthew Horn, Joseph Huffman, From the College of Engineering, receiving the Master of Science in Aerospace Engineering, James Biggs. Eric Rolf. Ronald K. Receiving the Master of Science in Biomedical Engineering, Taylor Johnson. Receiving the Master of Science in Chemical Engineering, Wei Shan Chin. Receiving the Master of Science in Civil Engineering, Francisca Mellis. Rachel Gordon. Stephen Florig. Kirsten Wild, Zachary Michael, Patrick Gilmartin, Dylan Bro, Corey Shawl. Sean O'Connell, Uzwal Pandey, Fawaz Al Mutiri, Elvaro Kaya Laguna. Jordan Perlum Titiri, Kimberly Martinson, Prakar Shrestha, Hai Lin, Han Ju. Asis Subedi, Enrique Torres Soto, Srinivasa Raju Penmetsa, Pragati Misore Paramesh, Gitanjali. Kuyamudi Nehru, Japsimran Singh, Shashank Gupta, Yusuf Rangunwala, Tyler Beach. Juan Campos, Adrian Hill, Christian Figueroa, Clinton Martin, Andrew Arnold,
receiving the Master of Science and Master of Engineering in Computer Engineering, Snehal Dixit. Receiving the Master of Science in Computer Science and Applications, Andrew Ciambroni. Receiving the Master of Science and Master of Engineering in Electrical Engineering, Alexander van der Hayden. Tian Tian. Shardul Adkar. Juan Lopez Marcano. Ran Guhandan M. Rao. Manasa Ananth. Mohammed Eta Shamudin. Gitesh Bhagwat. Receiving the Master of Science in Environmental Engineering, Zachary Kimak. Eric Munch. Pamela Rusinko. Receiving the Master of Science in Industrial Systems Engineering, Sudarshan Balakrishnan. Pranav Desai. Vrajbala Tejwasi Mukala. Pratik Hudar. Pranav Satish Herve. Abhishek Srinivasan. Alexander Torak. Receiving the Master of Science in Materials Science and Engineering, Ibrahim Kalfala. Receiving the Master of Engineering, Shuo Tang. Receiving the Master of Science in Mechanical Engineering, John Patrick Hutchinson. Stephen Powell. Receiving the Master of Arts in Education in Career and Technical Education, Kazito Mukuni. Receiving the Master of Arts in Education in Curriculum and Instruction, Andrew Hopen. Sarah Sweeten. Marina Sotelo. Adrian Young. Nauf Bintabit. Roberto Flores Garcia. Clarissa Stiles. Sarah Carper. Betty Spires. Jessica Hayes. Jonathan Neal. Sarah Cruz. Kelsey Birch. Receiving the Master of Arts in Foreign Languages, Cultures, and Literatures, Francisco Pinto Torres. Receiving the Master of Arts in Political Science, Bo Chapelier.
David Moore. Luke Shabro. Megan Baker. From the College of Natural Resources and Environment, receiving the Master of Science in Fisheries and Wildlife Sciences, Gretchen Stokes. Receiving the Master of Science and Master of Forestry in Forestry, Benjamin Poling. Trisha Sanwal. Receiving the Master of Science in Geography, Austin Kuhner. Trevor White. Receiving the Master of Natural Resources, Dana Zambrata. Dylan Chapins. Receiving the Master of Science in Statistics, Kyle Webb. Tai Ji Wang. From the Virginia Maryland Regional College of Veterinary Medicine, receiving the Master of Public Health, Danielle Short. Angelica Colagreco. Isabel Jimenez Bush, James Schlitt, <laughs> Catherine Williams. From interdisciplinary degree programs, receiving the Master of Information Technology, Cody Blakely. Yulia Bondar, Christine Broyhill, Travis Carter, Benita Curley, Jason Dominezak. Christopher Harding, Mohammed Islam, Ryan Kenny, James McWhorter, Russ Mamishas. Zuju, Sammy Lutfi Mized, Kendra Reed, David Sint, Williams Dionche. Deonche Williams, yeah. <laughs> Karen Wilson, <laughs> Howard Zimmering. I would like to be you when I grow up. So. <laughs> Do you? And now a round of applause for our master student recipients. As a final note, I would like to call upon Dr. Monte Abbas, President of the Faculty Senate, to bring a brief message of congratulations on behalf of the university faculty. Good afternoon, Hokies. What a beautiful day, full of joy and hope 
full of accomplishments and appreciation to those who were here for you along the way. As I welcome your families and friends, I would like to thank them and thank everyone who shared your academic journey from inception to this fantastic moment. I have the luxury and honor today to speak to you on behalf of the Virginia Tech faculty, so I will. On behalf of the faculty, on behalf of those who taught you in classes, those who contributed to your research, those who interacted with you on a daily basis, and on behalf of your own advisors, I'm proud of you. For your achievement, your patience, your dedication, your long nights of hard work, and your innovations and overall contributions to everything we hold dear at Virginia Tech. Hokies, go build the future. You are armed with knowledge, intelligence, passion, and youth. Don't ever despair, for every night there will be a following sun. And for every difficulty you face, there will follow a shining success. Don't think for a moment that there is something you cannot do. You can. Just remember, from now on, you are ambassadors for Virginia Tech, and through you, we will build the future. No pressure, Hawkeyes. <laughs> we do believe in you. Embody the ad prosim at heart. Live, love, and work hard, and let your work speak about you. And make the world a better place for all of us. Congratulations, go Hawkeyes. Thank you, Professor Abbas. A special thanks to Dr. Moola as the reader of names, to the faculty ushers and marshals, to Mr. Chandler, and to Wallace Easter and the members of the Virginia Tech Brass Ensemble for their part in this afternoon's ceremony. Now please stand until the stage party is recessed with the recessional our ceremony will be concluded. Thanks for joining us and have a safe trip home.